So today is March 20th. We are smack dab in the middle of what's called the Hungry Gap. And that's the time usually between March and May. And it's the hardest time to have anything fresh from your garden pretty much around the northern hemisphere. Um, I'm sure Australia is a little bit different and stuff. I don't know anything about growing in the southern hemisphere, but in the northern hemisphere, this is called the hungry gap. And they call it that because usually your garden is completely dormant. It's still too early to plant in your garden or your farm. But what I'm going to talk about today is involving this spinach that you see around me and a few other crops that are absolutely producing a bumper crop of food right now um, that is still amazing to me even though I've been doing this for a couple years now having fresh food at this time of year is just a game changer and we're sitting in the middle of this spinach greenhouse this is just a caterpillar tunnel which is basically just the steel structure that you see around me with one layer of plastic there's no added heat or anything in here, and I'm in Wyoming where it gets down to negative 20. This year it got down to negative 32. And all of this spinach survived through that. I've already harvested everything you see here twice. This has already been harvested twice. This has already been harvested twice. This has been harvested three times. Um, and so we're just pumping spinach out of here, and this is actually the very first time this greenhouse has been planted, so the soil is still not really great yet. Um, that's why there's all that yellow stuff behind me. But we're still pulling hundreds of pounds of spinach out of here. We're probably going to get another 50 pounds of spinach before this goes to seed, which probably will be soon. I've already got my next batch of spinach coming. But that is a lot of food, and you could do this in any greenhouse structure like this or a cold frame. It's something that I don't see enough people talking about. And maybe it's because in warmer climates, you don't have to try as hard or worry about it as much. But what I'm talking about is overwintering. And basically, if you grow crops for winter production, like I do and like I've talked about in my other videos, you get the overwintering benefit as a, a bonus plan basically it's already built into growing that spinach for the winter because it keeps growing um, as long as you don't have a crazy heat spell which we almost never do around here because it's just very cold climate you get the spinach to produce through March probably through April a little bit and then it starts to go to seed I'm sure in the south of the United States that's a totally different story I'm really talking about cold climates, northern climates in the US, Canada, stuff like that. Uh, I'm not familiar with growing in the south or humid environments, but I live in a very cold climate. This spinach survived negative 32 without any heat. All I did was cover it with this row cover. We did three layers of that for the negative 32 blast and double layered it a couple times. I found that it's, it's tough enough to probably just do a single layer. Uh, it just stays a little bit nicer the more you protect it, but this is a truckload of food and all you have to do is plant it in around September early September around here You need to plant it about nine weeks before your last 10 hour day if I remember correctly uh, There's a whole winter planting schedule out there to find out what that is in your area uh, But once it's mature by your last 10 hour day, you've got that spinach through December, January, you know, as long as you can keep it nice, you can harvest it down to about this level. And then once it starts to warm up and the daylight increases to above 10 hours, it starts to grow again. And you just have a truckload of greens in a time when there's usually nothing. You know, how many people do you know, if you live in northern climate, how many people do you know that have anything fresh coming from their garden right now? If they live north of, say, Colorado. I don't know anybody around here and so this is a game changer you got to try doing overwintering and winter growing and I'm going to go over a couple more crops too so right here in front of me is what we call miners lettuce or it's also known as Claytonia 
I've talked about this in a couple previous videos, but this plant is another bomb proof winter crop that also explodes right now. This is still not even mature yet, but once it does mature, this whole bed's gonna be full of this green with a beautiful white flower that I'm probably not gonna be able to sell all of it because I got a whole hundred foot bed of it here. It's just gonna be exploding. It's already starting to flower a little bit and it doesn't really seem to change the flavor, but it is the most beautiful salad green I've ever seen. It's not quite blooming yet. I'm actually a little surprised. I figured it would be by now, but part of that is because the soil in this greenhouse is brand new and not even close to in balance yet. But this can, this is actually native to the Rocky Mountains. So it grows wild in the mountains, even around here, Colorado. I'm pretty sure they call it miner's lettuce because coal miners or gold miners were you know, eating it to stay alive when they weren't finding anything to harvest, to, uh, you know, mine. Uh, so I'm sure there's a whole story about that that I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, this is a really cool crop that I don't see a lot of people talking about. And the seed's kind of hard to find. You can get it at Johnny's. Uh, I'm not sure if where else you can get it, but it's a bomb proof one that you could do if you live in anywhere, even colder climates than here, I'm sure you could do this. It's just about getting the timing right and getting it to grow correctly. And it's a little tricky. I've had trouble with it. It's just uh, kind of fussy with fungal issues and uh, the greens rotting at the bottom because it gets so thick. But it is a bomb proof one and just, you know, it's produced a truckload of stuff for us during December and January which is great and usually we have a still pretty good amount of stuff like carrots and roots coming out of the ground so there's still quite a bit of food at that time of year for us uh, but the bonus plan for me is this time of year because I'm a farm I'm a vegetable farm so I am growing all this stuff to be sold but even if you were doing this on a homestead or a garden, it's just an extra bonus crop that you will never have if you tried to plant something right now. You know, there's, if you live in the northern climate, you can't really have much coming out of the field. I follow people from South Carolina that don't even have a whole lot coming out of their gardens right now. Um, in a greenhouse, maybe they do, but it's uh, really cool to be able to have an abundance of food at this time of year and yeah you could get tired of eating salad but there's more to this than just salad and all we're doing is planting the crop to be mature in the winter and then you got to do pay attention to it when it gets to negative 30 and make sure it's protected and everything but if you do the math on the work there even on a homestead it's like one or two times throughout the winter you have to bundle the crop up tuck it in for bed you know like it's basically exactly what you're doing. You're tucking in your crop, which is your kid in some scenarios, uh, and making sure it survives that cold blast. And then you take the, the blanket off. That's what these are, these row covers. And then it grows again, that's it. It's not like I'm doing this every day. I know some farms do that. I don't really see the point in that at all. It works fine this way. Um, I'm sure it minorly affects the quality, but this is still super great and it's definitely not the sexiest salad greens that we ever get but some of it actually tastes best at this time of year i know the spinach is my personal favorite time to eat spinach is right now because it's still got that really nice sweetness from getting cold but it's really hearty as well it doesn't just turn into nothing when you cook it it's really tough um you can just tell the leaves are different and just having an abundance at this time of year is, is awesome. It doesn't get old. So this is our Siberian kale crop. And this is doing amazing. This was literally this big like five weeks ago. And it's almost ready to harvest again. It really needs water, actually. I got to turn the irrigation on in here and it'll just explode. But this is going to be a whole nother harvest. We've already harvested this once. And it's going to be a full bed of kale uh, which is 
a lot nicer than just eating salad all the time. You know, kale is something you could at least, you know, put in stews and soups and stuff. And um, it's a lot heartier than just lettuce. So this is Siberian kale. It's supposed to be a little tougher than regular kale. I'm pretty sure regular kale would work almost just as well. I haven't tried it yet, but this is bred for Siberia, which is pretty similar climate to Wyoming, to be honest. But it's, you know, another bomb proof one. And the other cool thing about this one is when this one starts to bolt and go to seed, it turns into this like broccoli thing that's also edible and super sweet. It's like bro kale broccolini. And it's, that's another crop on top of your second crop. It's like a third little crop. Uh, you know, from a business perspective, that, that kale broccoli is kind of worthless, but for a homestead, it's not, you know, there's a ton of, there's a dinner or two out of that. And if you're really into growing your own food and being in charge of your own life with, you know, without having to rely on the store, this is a useful skill, especially if you live in a crazy cold climate like I do. Granted, I do have a high tunnel greenhouse. Um, I have high tunnels and then I have these caterpillar tunnels. These caterpillar tunnels are dirt cheap. You could buy these for, you could probably buy a 25 foot version of this for about $1,000 to $1,500. Put it up in a weekend and you'd have something in your yard. You know, the only thing that you do have to worry about, at least in Wyoming, is wind. And I live in a pretty windy place, but it's got a lot of wind breaks, so I don't know if this would survive 50 mile an hour winds. We probably get 35 here um, and it's still pretty new I have to make it a little fancier but even if you put a little bit of effort into your end walls um, to make sure that they're a little tighter you know I just have the plastic dangling off the ends that's pretty you know redneck it's not real great for um, wind but if you put a little effort into your end walls that makes it windproof so there's lots of cheap ways to get a greenhouse if you do live in a super cold climate like what we do if you live in a zone six or below, you probably could do some of this stuff without a greenhouse. A lot of out overwintering happens in those kinds of climates. Um, and you know, this kale definitely isn't the sexiest kale. There's frost burn and stuff, but if you're really into this stuff and if you really pay attention to the flavor, this flavor is light years better than anything you're gonna get in the store. It's super sweet and it doesn't look as sexy as the store, but it is something that you can grow and you can feed yourself with. Uh, to me, that's really valuable, but not everybody feels the same way about this stuff and aren't as obsessed as I am. But I think uh, this is a really great way to have a food sovereign lifestyle, whether you're doing this as a business or not, and it's not being talked about enough. All right, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is what you see here, which is red Russian kale. It's another kind of kale. and. It's the same concept, you know. The only difference is this has grown more of a baby green. So it's sort of like a, another spinach kind of thing because you can cook this stuff, you can make it into salad. It's the same as your red Russian kale. You could probably buy it at the store, or you brought it at the store before, but it's just smaller. And I just direct seeded it with a push seeder, which is what I use, but in your garden, you could just use your hands and it works just as good. And I'm actually a little surprised this did this well because I, I thought this was less tough than um, some of the other crops that we grew that didn't do as well. And I only single or double covered this during the negative 32 blast and it did fine. This bed is really bad because again the soil is terrible. We had a big aphid invasion at the fall during the fall last year that kind of devastated a lot of the brassicas in here. But uh, it's still not bad so next year when we do this video which i probably will again because i'm so obsessed with this concept it'll look just like a jungle in all of the areas we've talked about there's this is only the tip of the iceberg what i'm talking about too there's other possibilities you could do with overwintering that are way beyond just spinach you could do it with carrots i've actually got some carrots growing right now that are kind of overwintered i'll explain that in a minute um, there's onions that's another possibility and I've been trying a lot of this stuff for a while and it haven't been successful until this year but it, some of this stuff does take some trial and error but it, it costs you some seed basically to try it you might as well try it every year you just got to remember to do it 
you know, one of the big things I think that is missing in the gardening and vegetable production space is the topic of planting all season long. Not enough people are talking about that in the gardening context. You can produce food. I plant on the farm from basically January through first week in October. I'm planting something. And that's not including microgreens. Microgreens, that's a whole different thing. But that's something that's going to be going in the ground. And most of it on my farm is in an unheated greenhouse. And so there's a lot more potential in your garden that I think most people think about. A lot of people just get excited about planting in May. And then once July comes around, there's a big jungle of weeds in their garden and uh, they lose motivation to plant anything else. But if you keep being disciplined and planting just little bits of certain crops all the time, it doesn't become as much of a hassle or big project. And, and honestly, you're planting way less than you are in the spring. I'm planting right now in my seeding area. You know, I could be seeding for four or five hours at a time because I have so much to plant right now because it's spring. It's the busiest time of year for seeding. But I don't spend that much time doing it. Basically, starting in June, we do about an hour or two a week on the farm right now. I'm sure that'll change as the farm gets bigger. But there's really not a lot to be seeding, at least in the seeding station, all through the summer. And, and then direct seeding in the ground is just as easy, you know. The, you should be planting carrots all the way up until at least the first week in July. Pretty regularly, like once a month to have a constant supply. And this overwintering thing is the same concept. It's really continuing to plant and making sure you get the right planting dates. That's a whole rabbit hole. There's some good resources on winter planting at Johnny's website if you look at their website. I'll put a link in the description below on their winter planting schedule because that will pretty much explain how I do this but you still got to plug in your last 10 hour day and everything and I've been playing with those dates for a couple years and I found that I have to tweak them a little bit just it's not as simple as just following it perfectly but you know if you got enough space in your garden or your greenhouse just do a couple different plantings and then you'll figure it out you know I figured out this probably is the right date for this miner's lettuce but um the soil is a little rough, so that's why it didn't grow quite right. You know, I've done that planting enough to know that I got the timing right, but the soil was wrong. You know, things like that are what you got to take notes of and learn for next year. But once you get this right, it's just so much more production of food that you can produce yourself that uh, I think a lot of people are missing out on, especially in a northern climate. You know, if you want to really take this local food thing seriously, overwintering is a huge part of it, and I think it's awesome. Um, you know, it's not the sexiest food in the world, but it is some of the tastiest food in the world. So food for thought. So that's pretty much the concept of overwintering. If you ever hear that word throwing, thrown around, that's what it is. It's planting something to be mature before winter and then it regrows in the early spring. Or it doesn't even have to be 100% mature. It could be partially mature and then it just grows and matures in the early spring and so that's a great way to have a truckload of food at a time of year when most people don't have any food of their own that they grew themselves fresh you know there's a difference between fresh and storage crops i have storage crops too but having something fresh alongside the storage crops makes eating a lot more fun and makes feeding yourself through the year a lot more realistic in my opinion because if you're like me, storage carrots at this time of year can start to get kind of furry and green and gross. Onions start to go a little soft, depending on how well you've cured them. That's a whole rabbit hole in itself, but I get a little tired of eating just the same storage crops I've been eating since December. I, I want to have something to be excited about at a time of year when there's not much to be excited about. And this helps get me through that time of year when I don't have a lot of fresh things. Um, it's also, for me, it's like a like a morale booster almost, because I'm obsessed with this growing food stuff, and um, I want to have fresh stuff all the time. I don't want to have a six-month gap where I don't have anything to harvest. So 
it kind of keeps me going until April or May when the first fresh radishes and turnips and stuff will be coming out of the greenhouse. And it makes the winter a lot more tolerable for me. And that maybe that's just me, I don't know. I'm, I'm weird, I'm hard to relate to, I know that. But the potential in this winter overwintering stuff is just awesome and I'd like to see more people doing it. So hope you enjoyed that and we'll see